What's going on guys? Mark back here with another video and today as I told you all earlier in my little promo video that I was going to have Eric Marks on the show today, uh, we're going to be talking about Fuji and I know that a lot of uh, other people had been uh, waiting for uh, this conversation to be happening so I'm glad to finally be bringing it to you and we've got a lot of stuff to cover so Eric why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself just in case there is some people that decided not to do their research even though I put all of your links down in the uh, the the show <laughs> notes below. All right, cool. Yeah, so uh, I'm Eric Marks. Uh, you can check me out at FindingMiddleEarth.com. Uh, I'm a huge Tolkien nerd, so I love Lord of the Rings. And that's pretty much my whole life is fantasy and imagination and living in a dream world. So it's kind of how I got into photography and creative, but just pushing reality away from myself. Um, but yeah, I prefer primarily. Um, I'm uh, education stuff instead of, but the client work I've done has been anything from uh, you know engagement shoots weddings architecture stuff I've kind of been in every genre uh, and I just like landscape the best and it's hard to make money from landscape photography so I decided I would try to teach landscape photography so that's where I am right now and uh, yeah we've both kind of recently found Fujifilm cameras and so uh, it, they're they're just unbelievable Sweet. Uh, and I am like ridiculously new because um, I, I just bought my Fujifilm camera like four or five days ago. So, but I did have the loaner and I really, it was a bad, bad move on my part because I, I already had a feeling that as soon as I saw the camera, I was like, yes, yes, I definitely want to be trying this camera out. But, uh, to it and there was always so much other Sony stuff to, to cover and uh, a lot of my viewers obviously want to see Sony stuff but you know damned damned the devil uh, I had to go ahead and pick up a, a copy and I immediately immediately fell in love yeah so you what Sony camera did you come from um, I came from the 6300 I was okay. interested in the APS-C line of, of bodies now I was an original Nikon shooter okay. um, and the last one that I had was the Nikon uh, D800 and I also had the uh, Nikon D610 um, so I was a full frame shooter but I wanted I knew that when I transitioned from them uh, over to Sony that I wanted to get in with that smaller camera and the a6000 really just kind of blew my mind it, it completely changed the way I thought about what a camera ought to look like to right. get good pictures you know what I mean yeah and uh, it was a really strange experience because everyone went, dude, that's a toy. You know, that's a piece of shit. You know, that's not a real camera. You know, yeah. there's no way you're ever going to take real pictures with that camera. So, but yeah, yeah that's there, essentially how I started. Yeah, that's that's one thing I'm I'm starting to notice because I'm semi new to the YouTube thing. I know you've been doing it for a while, and so I've noticed that photographers are are mean online. You know, I'm having to get used to that. It, it's weird. It's like you know, when, when you're online and you shoot Fujifilm or Nikon or whatever, it's like they only focus on the brand name that's in your hands. But like if I'm, you know, out and about shooting somewhere and I just see another photographer, it's never like that. You know, it's weird. It's like they're just like, oh, hey, what's up, man? You're taking photos of a sunset and it doesn't really matter what gear we're using. So, yeah, the, the whole Gear Wars thing is is really not why I moved to Fujifilm because a lot of people, you know, the, people will talk all day long about DSLR versus mirrorless and like you were saying that, you know, a lot of your Sony shooters might have been freaked out if you moved to Fujifilm, but it's really all about like the best tool for the job at the time that we're shooting and I think Fujifilm cameras are just like a photographer's camera. Like they feel good in the hand, the controls are where you want them to be and they're just super easy to use. Like I can, I picked it up and within like a day I was just using everything like it was just second nature. It's just, they're, they're great to use and obviously the image quality is fantastic right and it, it's interesting that you bring up that uh photographers are mean i would characterize them more as pompous assholes um, <laughs> and there are several of them out there that you know i don't generally name them by name uh just because most of them already or most of my viewers probably watch them too and uh the thing of it is is that i don't understand why it's always uh this pecker measuring contest every single time we have to open our camera bag it's just like who really cares yeah. what i'm shooting with like you don't have to hold it you don't have to carry it <laughs> what do you care yeah no I, I completely agree it's and you know i don't 
yeah, like you said, like I know there's a lot of YouTube feuds going on in the photography world right now, but it's just, you know, and I'm not, and I'm not saying photographers are mean in general. I'm just saying that, you know, it, yes, it's they pretty, are. Yes, they it, are. Absolutely. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's so weird how online, you know, it, it's all about the brand name. And then when you're in person, it's just about like, you know, let's go have fun and shoot. And it doesn't really matter what you're shooting with. And yeah, it's just like, you know, life's too short for that kind of stuff. So, uh, and, and what's funny is that, uh, with Fujifilm, it's almost like, Fujifilm, the fan base is like a cult. Like they love Fujifilm stuff. But one thing I've noticed is they typically don't badmouth, like Fujifilm shooters don't typically badmouth other brands. But like me as a DSLR shooter, I used to be like, oh my gosh, mirrorless cameras. There's another little toy. You know, there's a there's another little point and shoot camera that's gonna take four megapixel cute photos. But then, you know, when I when I started giving them a chance, I mean, they're I, I started noticing it's not really about DSLR versus mirrorless anymore because that's just I mean, they're the the technology is on par and the image quality is so on par that it's really just about I me mean, what camera works for you and and the Fujifilm stuff. Uh, I like I like I was telling you a little bit ago. I'm. I originally bought the Fujifilm camera, the X-T2, to go on a, a Disney World trip with my family as like a little small travel uh, thing. And now, this is not a travel camera anymore. It's a battery grip with a, a right. 15 pound, 16 to 55 two point. I mean, this is like my main camera now. So you know, it's it's just it, I. It was too good to just make it a travel camera. So it's really. At this point, I just use my Nikon D810 and my X-T2, just whatever, depending on whatever mood I'm in. So if I'm in like a hipster, you know, black and white mood, I'll pick up the Fuji camera or, you know, whatever. And then, you know, I might use the D810 if I want to make a large print. There's not, you know, you don't have to categorize the camera for one specific thing. Yeah. And, you know, you bringing up all that stuff. I, I was kind of an early adopter as far as mirrorless uh, cameras were concerned anyway, because uh, at that time, about two and a half years ago, like mirrorless was still in its infancy really and there was not there were not very many options whatsoever and so i took a chance and once i used it i really liked it and i was like oh my god this is so much lighter the lenses are so much smaller um my biggest problem uh here at least recently is mainly the fact that um sony has not developed many lenses for the aps-c line of cameras that they have right now so um i i've been ridiculously patient you know, over these last couple of years, I've, you know, really tried to uh, be a uh, vocal spokesperson for mirrorless, uh, for people that were wanting to lighten their camera load, so to speak. Right. And um, I don't know, you know, I, you just get tired of waiting around. It's like, why do I, why should I have to wait uh, yeah. while Sony is, you know, releasing, you know, full frame lens after full frame lens uh, for the A7 guys and now the A9 um, and Fuji only makes crop sensor cameras. So right. every last one of their fantastic lenses is already made for that size sensor. And, right. and you know, it, if Sony released lenses at the same rate they did cameras, I think Sony <laughs> would be phenomenal. It'd be a great company to shoot with. Because then you get a new lens every five minutes and it would be perfect. Oh my God. You know how many people would just be all over that? But, you know, they don't. And that's, and that's the biggest problem is that they don't. And they haven't. So, um... You know, shame on them because I ended up, you know, I've been trying out different cameras. As a matter of fact, I was seriously contemplating uh, taking a look at uh, the Panasonic system, and I did. I gave them their fair shot. Um, I just can't really go down that small in sensor size. Yeah. Um, it's not that I don't like the Micro Four Thirds format. Um, the, the images that the camera itself was producing were, fin you know, fantastic. The depth of field wasn't as horrible as I thought that it was going to be. Um but I can still I can still just do um, a little bit more without making too big of a compromise, right? I guess. Yeah. Did uh. So yeah, I've had a lot of people look into the Micro Four Third system. But do you do you mainly shoot portraits or what? What's like your main genre that you shoot? Yeah, most of the stuff that I do is um, it's usually portraiture. Uh, a lot of I, I that's the reason a lot of people don't see a whole lot of my stuff uh, because it is private. Uh, so I do a lot of like fetish a okay. lot of uh boudoir stuff like that um i haven't done that as much lately though i've noticed that uh i am getting away from that more and more um not necessarily because i want to but i moved out of the city mm -hmm. uh, and i've got more land here so it's it's a lot quieter it's a it's a little bit slower um so i'm not around uh all the crowds that i were that generated a lot of my uh portraiture and uh boudoir work but that's what i really like but i'm also um a huge fan 
of detail work, uh, macro photography, small things. Um, it, it, honestly, today I was out shooting landscapes, and I never do that. But yesterday, I was at uh, my best friend's uh, birthday party, and he lives out uh, in this beautiful area with these gorgeous rolling hills and the clouds were nice and thick and billowy and i was taking all these shots with the fuji yesterday with the 16 millimeter f14 by the way yeah. and uh oh my god i was just like <laughs> i i got i gotta go out today and do it again so yeah um, that that's that's the next lens that i want in my bag that when you told me you had that i, I was jealous because i that's the only one i don't have right now other than the big like 100 to 400 but uh yeah that that lens i've heard is just ridiculously sharp uh, it, it, not only is it sharp, but I mean, it renders so beautifully and, uh, having the grain effect and stuff just, you know, directly built in. Um, and I'm a grain slut. I absolutely love film. So I usually buy like the Ilford HP five or the, uh, Ilford Delta film, yeah. uh, just so I can get that heavy grain effect. Um, a lot, you know, a lot of people don't like it. They like it to just be as clean as possible. I prefer it to be a little bit more gritty and a little bit more dirty, but you know, that's it's all personal preference. Yeah. So what? Um, because I've you know I've seen a lot of portrait shooters go back and forth about crop sensor and full frame sensor or whatever, and uh, I'm sure now you'll realize as you get more lenses into the Fuji system, like you even said with the Micro Four Thirds, the the bokeh isn't that bad. I mean, it's not like, you know, you're shooting at F22 on a full frame sensor and everything's just in focus. But right. um, I don't know, there's something about the way the Fujifilm cameras render skin tones, at least in my opinion, that's just so pleasing that I can deal with, you know, giving up a little bit of the bokeh from the full frame sensor. Because ever I have a, a 13 month old daughter and I've been shooting her on the Fujifilm camera for the past six months. And like every time I shoot like a birthday party or like her one year birthday party or whatever, like, I just, I get it into the, into Lightroom or, or capture one or whatever. And I'm just like, there's, you know, I don't even know what, like the white balance is perfect. Maybe add a little bit of contrast. And I'm just good to go. Like, I like guess just so good. The files are just beautiful. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I was doing some, uh, portrait photography yesterday with my best friend. He's got a couple of young daughters and I mean, I, I was just taken aback every single time that I would take the shots. Not only is it just a joy to shoot with because of all the external controls, wheels, knobs, buttons, and all that, but um, like you said, it renders so well. I, in in that's Fuji's just got a lot of experience with film and right. that color, and their their ability to reproduce that film color in the digital space. Yeah, I mean. That was that was a big eye opener for me. So I didn't have to, you know, take a digital shot uh, and then bring it into some, you know, editor and then try and make it look the way these are already looking. And in a lot of cases, I don't even want to f with the the raw files um, because the JPEGs, the JPEG engine is that good in the camera. Yeah, the JPEGs are really good. Yeah, the on the Acros film simulation for black and white with the yes. JPEG. I mean, you can't touch that with any other black and white software. It's yes. So good. It is fantastic. Yeah. So uh, good. here's a question for you. So when I first got the the X-T2 and the whole Fujifilm camera, the or when I was looking at them, that the manual aperture rings, like all the dials on top being manual, kind of scared. Like it was cool, but it kind of scared me a little bit uh, to kind of move from, you know, everything in kind of like a twisty dial format on the, the Nikon system to go to there. Did you have like problems with that at all because i like for a day i was a little freaked out and then now it's just like so quick because i can do everything with the camera at my eye like I, I have everything there and it's so quick well um i wouldn't say that it scared me it was just uh, a big change because uh, pr like you said prior i was nikon so everything was command dials front and back all the time <clears throat> and then with the sony everything is dive down into a menu you know um they have gotten better about being able to um use the 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 back four-way directional pad in order to access a lot of uh functions but just having all of this you know directly on the camera is pretty amazing with the latest updates and everything uh assigning you know the command dial to your iso the front command dial to your iso and giving it a more dslr like uh feel if you do have to do a like a wedding or a job where you're having to move really fast uh, just having all that control right there on the front and rear command dials i mean you can have the best of both worlds. You can have not only mirrorless, but you can have a mirrorless camera that's extremely powerful. Uh, but if you need to, you know, do serious, fast, and hardcore run and gun, uh, and you need that command dial functionality without all the hassle of the buttons and all that, then you can. So it it started 
I don't know, just slapping me right in the mouth going, dude, you need this camera. Yeah. Oh yeah. I hear you. Um, yeah, the, the whole, so this is another thing that made me jump into it. And this is, I, I still talk about this cause it amazes me like the Fuji versus Nikon, Canon, Sony, whoever it's like the, not only do you look at the gear and, and obviously how it works for you is very important, but another huge important step is the, the customer service of the company. Like how are they going to take care of your gear? How are they going to take care of you? Do they listen to their customers, you know? Mm -hmm. And a few months after I got the X-T2, uh, I was kind of new to the whole firmware update thing. I didn't know that they literally upgraded the camera with the firmware. And so when I saw that I was getting an autofocus improvement and better face tracking, I was like, wait, how much is this going to cost me? And it was just like, oh, it'll be free in a couple of days on the Fuji website. It's like, <laughs> blowing my mind because right. with Nikon or, or Sony or whoever, typically it's like the D800 has good autofocus. Now it's a little faster by the D810 for $3,200. But like right. here, it's just like, you know, we gave it a little lift. Here's a free firmware update. And um, another little story, when I first got the X-T2, I thought I had uh, kind of a, a dud X-T2 because I, I took a long exposure with it and I saw a, a bunch of little like white, hot pixels everywhere which is typical of a long exposure but they were they, they were like in the same place every time and uh i i called fuji tech support and i said hey i don't know you know is there something i can do is this is this normal i have no clue uh and they said oh you go into the menu and go down to the pixel mapping setting and just you know click that before you do a uh, a long exposure and the camera made some weird sounds on the inside and i took a long exposure gone i was like what magic are these like these people are wizards and i don't understand what like i don't even know what that is right. they explained it to me and how it works and so it's just like everything from the the menu being well thought out and the tech support being very reliable customer service listening to their photographers it's just like an all-around really good company in quality gear um you know and and that was one of the things um that i was not exactly keen on because uh well not as far as fuji is concerned but here's the thing um i was in the uh, I was at the Sony press event down in Austin, Texas, back in November, uh, and they flew us down there to check out the brand new A6500. Um, while I was excited to go try it out, um, at the exact same time, I had just purchased an A6300 back in March. Right. <laughs> so yeah. then they released another camera that effectively was a side grade from the A6300, but those features could have easily been in the camera that I just bought. So I was ever so slightly bitter about that. Uh, but at the same time, um, I gave them, you know, my feedback on the camera. We shot for three days and you know, I, I do feel like they do listen, but at the same time, those APS shooters, there's a lot of APSC size shooters yeah, now, and definitely. there's absolutely no reason to ignore that line of cameras. And they genuinely have as far as their lens selection goes. So, I like um, the fact that Fuji already had all that stuff in place for me. Um, I'm not really huge on the whole, you know, bash in a camera company. Um, I think that they are trying to make good financial decisions. And if people want to shell out two or three thousand dollars for a new camera body every couple of years, good on them. They're allowed to do whatever they want to with their money. Right. Um, but I will say that while I have not yet had a single solitary problem out of this camera, um, all of the good stories, all of the uh, non-horrific stories about customer support, uh, listening to their photographers, uh, providing that extra level of you know backup whenever something is kind of wonky with it, yeah. really was encouraging to, because it, no one wants to switch to a brand new camera company every single time some bit of new tech comes out. Sometimes, right. you know, you just, you invest a bunch of money into a system and it just, it's just too much of a hassle to switch. So all of those things in combination really were the, the perfect storm for me. No lenses. Um, you know, they basically outdated my camera within, you know, six months of me purchasing it. And, uh, just having all those external controls, the color, the JPEG engine, the ability to make it as pro as possible with the battery grip uh, so I can shoot for longer periods of time. Uh, the fact that it had uh, phase auto detect, which Panasonic did not, it, it really was a no brainer for me. So, yeah. So that, so when, uh, so I guess uh, since you shot Sony for, so how, how long did you shoot Sony after Nikon or did you shoot them both kind of parallel? Well, um, I shot Sony and uh, Nikon parallel for roughly about uh, two months. And 
once I got really used to the smaller form factor and everything, um, I was just absolutely blown away. I was just like, so I can adapt damn near any lens from any company onto this thing. And, you know, the flange diff uh, distance could be easily accommodated with any dummy adapter. Yeah. Um, and so that was a really exciting thing to consider that I didn't have to just buy Nikon lenses. I could buy Canon lenses. I could buy uh, whatever lenses I wanted and it would fit on this camera. Um, but it became really clear that I, at that point in time, I was not missing my full frame when I was taking the, uh, the Sony out with me. Right. Uh, and it was lighter, uh, easier to transport, not as bulky. I was uh, more incognito, but I was still able to get the uh, image quality that I was wanting even for client work. Um, but the, uh, the whole thing was that for the last two and a half years since I've been shooting Sony, that's a long time to wait for good, high quality 2.8 zooms, you yes, know, and they're just not, they're just not there. So for me to not have uh, a 16 to, uh, you know, uh, or a 24 to 70 equivalent or a 70 to 200 equivalent is, you know, no super fast zooms is a big deal for a lot of people that have to do professional work right yeah that's that's one thing that that i found well the one of the cool things i guess that i found when i when i moved over to fujifilm so the first thing kind of like you said i i wanted to just stick my nikon gear in the bag and just not use it uh until i wanted to use it and, and i thought well if the day comes to where you know i like have to use the nikon and i'm getting sick of the fujifilm maybe that'll tell me something i don't know what it'll be indicative of necessarily but maybe it'll tell me that you know i'm not ready to get rid of my full frame gear so i still have both just because i have so much invested in nikon lenses but um as i've been building my lens selection with fujifilm what's what's been great to see is that it's really and you'll see this too. It's you'll be really hard pressed to find like a bad Fujifilm lens. Like there's there's some lenses in in the Fujifilm line that aren't quite as good as other Fujifilm lenses, but there's no just terrible, you know, light fall off, horrible distortion, just terrible blurry lenses. Even the kit lens, the 2.8 to f4 is I mean yes. phenomenal as far as kit lenses go. It's so yes. good and so light, and it's built better than any kit lens I've ever used. And it's just you know the just the thought, the quality. You know, it's Fujifilm almost feels like the the, like like Apple used to, like in, in Apple's good days with the Apple products, like where they literally just put love and passion into every single thing they did. You know, I feel that. And so what, this might sound stupid, but I tell people a lot of times, like it, you have to love the camera you're shooting with. I mean, aesthetically, you have to have fun shooting with it in your hands to really kind of, you know, come together and, and be creative and make a, you know, have, be passionate about photography. And, you know, if you have this huge brick that you're carrying around that you just don't like shooting with, it is going to affect your images because you're not going to be having as much fun. And so when I have the Fujifilm camera in my hands, I'm just like having a blast. Like it's just fun to shoot with. You know, and it's interesting that you say that um, because I, I had a list of stuff that, you know, I had kind of written down about um, all the different stuff that I liked about it. Um, but one of the things uh, that you pointed on was the fact that you know, if you do not have a, a piece of gear that inspires you to pick it up, uh, to throw it in your bag, to go shoot, you know, I I was <laughs> I had even considered making a video about this. It was really funny uh, that you you that you brought it up because it it reminded me of it. Is like how many times have I don't know someone gone to to some dead relative's house, you know, and they've got a, a shit ton of old camera gear in their closet and you never saw that person with a camera in their hand the entire time you knew them. Right. You know, and that was because they bought a camera that did not inspire them to pick it up. Um, they, they never shot with it because they were never interested in using that gear. I don't want to be that guy. I want it, when I go, whenever that happens to be, I hope it's a really long time and I hope for everyone watching that it's a really long time, but I hope that whatever camera you ended up with, that when you die, they bury you with your camera. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Because you, yeah. they always saw you with it. They always saw you enjoying it. They, you, you got so much joy uh, and excitement from your gear that you, you never wanted to be without it. I don't want it to. I don't want my gear to end up in an estate auction somewhere. You know, yeah. because I didn't give a crap about it and I never used it. And uh, the sexy design of the Fuji XT2 and the X Pro2, for that matter. Uh, yeah. If you happen to be a fan of the rangefinder style cameras, it's it, they're gorgeous cameras. They, they when are. I whenever I look at it, like over here on my on my shelf or whatever, I go, oh dang, I got to play with that for a second. You know what I mean? 
You yeah. know, and, oh, and, I know. I, and I'm not taking a picture of anything. It may be just shit here in my office or whatever, but I'm like, dang, I gotta, I gotta just pick it up just for a second and just yeah. mess around with it. Yeah. So yeah, that's, and that's exactly why I was saying it's like, like Apple in the old days, like, like when you would buy a new Apple product or like one of those companies that just really had good thought out stuff. Like it was, it, at least for me, and maybe I'm saying this because I used to work at an Apple store, but I, uh, <laughs> like, it, it was an experience like buying an Apple product, opening it up, you know, turning it on. Like it was just, it's just a thing. So like when I bought the X-T2, I posted a, an unboxing video on my YouTube channel and I'm like a little child. I'm like, oh my gosh, look how small it is. Like, I, I'm just like, I set it on the couch in the video and I realized I was like, you know what, let me just, I'm just going to bring it back because I just want it close to me. It was just, it's just so fun to shoot with. It's, it's just, I don't know, like I have it on my desk right here. Like we're filming this thing and I can't, it's not in my camera bag. I got mine right here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And so, and, and. What's funny is, so like, you know, I, I've shot with DSLRs and I mean, for just forever. And I know everyone always says, oh, the best photographers have their cameras with them at all, you know, all the time. But uh, seriously, with this one, I'll ditch the battery grip and put on the kit lens and I'll just take it with me almost everywhere I go. I mean, I'll just yes. have it on my shoulder. If I'm going into a restaurant, you know, I'll set it on the table. If I'm, it'll just always be with me. And I, I take more photos because I love the camera. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's basically, I mean, I'm, I'm, sort of like forced into that situation right now because I only have the two lenses. But the reason I I ended up going ahead and buying the kit lens was because I had seen too many people, including yourself, that said, I, I, I don't think I'd want to be without it. Number one, because it's full of useful focal lengths. It's, yeah. you know, 18, 35, 50. You know, it's got all the useful focal lengths. Uh, it's image stabilized. Um, and it's dirt cheap. But... At the exact same time, it is not like a regular kit lens that most other manufacturers put out with their cameras. Most of them start off at 3.5. Right. Just and how good is the Fujifilm image stabilization? Is oh it, my, not it unbelievable? Is, it is fantastically it is. good. So yeah, I've gotten I've gotten usable shots at like a tenth of a second, and even even slower. And it's because it, I I took it to Disney World. That's like the first time I got to test it. And I normally take it like a small travel tripod into Disney World. And so many places I would just you know just hold it and kind of you know do my breathing thing as if I were like shooting a rifle or something. And I would just right you know, right. It was just I mean tack sharp every time. So I know this is probably sounding like the biggest Fuji fanboy video in the world, but oh, I mean it does it, it does. It's just. I, you know, I haven't, I haven't gotten sick of it yet. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, of course I'm curious in a year from now, year and a half from now, you know, how I feel about it. And I'm sure, uh, by that time I'll probably own a GFX cause I've been drooling over that camera, <laughs> but man, they're, they just make good products. All right. So let me go ahead and take a couple of comments here real quick. And, uh, then I want to start thinking about maybe some of the things that you don't like about it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, if you can think of any, I mean, it's yeah. probably a short list, but <laughs> yeah. I, cause I mean, most people were kind of expecting me to probably say some good things cause I'm still in my honeymoon phase, you know? Mm -hmm. So I figured yeah. you probably have a little bit of uh, extra time to yeah. uh, find some quirks that you don't really like. So anyway, uh, I did have a question here from, uh, Lucas. He says, uh, that's why I left Sony. Most of their lenses are targeted at their full frame lineup. Uh, so they're big and expensive and, I 100% agree with you, Lucas. There is um, a good model that Sony does have, so that if you if you happen to already be a Sony full frame shooter, uh, because they have expanded their full frame lens lineup uh, so rapidly, uh, they anticipate those guys picking up a APS-C size camera and being just fine. So if they happen to pick up an A6500 to complement their A7R Mark II or something. Uh, those photographers already know that they're going to get fantastic images out of their full frame camera. And with that full frame glass, you know, being paired with a uh, APS-C size sensor, uh, the images are going to stay looking great. They're just going to get that extra reach. It is not so uh, intuitive and ideal for the strictly APS-C shooters to buy full frame lenses because the, le the lenses are huge. They're, the glass is heavy. If you want APS-C, you're going to APS-C because you want that smaller form factor. You want that lighter weight. You want that less bulk in your bag. So, um, yeah, that was the main reason why I even started considering some of these smaller uh, sensor companies because they had lighter, cheaper, uh, less heavy, less bulky lenses. So, um, Gaston says... Fuji cameras with all the bonus firmware updates is awesome. Easy to use, fantastic image quality, stunning JPEG. That's the camera to buy. That's the camera I bought. So yeah. 
Well, that and you know what's funny is too there. Fujifilm is really appealing to a lot of people that aren't just pros too. A lot of people that were buying like the the Canon PowerShot point and shoots, just kind of getting a family camera. I don't know how Fujifilm marketing is like reaching this, you know, this bracket of people, but like just regular families, like mom and dads that want a, you know, a family camera, they'll, I've seen so many people pick up like an X-T1 or an X-T2 or whatever, and they'll use it as their family camera with just like the kit lens. And I mean, it's, it's so good. It's, it's appealing to so many people because it's easy to use. The technology is there. The face tracking and the eye autofocus is fantastic. And it's a great family camera. It's good for landscapes. So it's just a very versatile system. And I really do think that Fuji is probably going to kill it with the X-T20 yeah. um, because that is such a uh, well-priced, well-rounded uh, intro into the Fuji line of cameras uh, and competitively priced with uh, cameras like the a6300 like the you know canon uh, lower end dslrs like the t6i or t7i yes, whatever the hell is point. out yeah. um it's also uh competitively priced with say like the nikon even the d uh 5000 line um so it was a really good idea for fuji to refresh the x uh, the X-T10 uh, with right. the X-T20 because you still get the same image processor that you get in the X-T2 and the X-Pro2. You still get the same sensor that you get in that pro-level line of bodies, but, I mean, it is literally half the cost and all the same lenses fit because they only make APS-C cameras. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, the ecosystem is great. The Yeah, the fact... So a lot of people ask me about the X-T20, actually. They, a lot of people say, so why haven't you gotten one yet? Or why haven't you traded in your X-T1 and gotten the X-T20 as the backup? And uh, yeah, I mean, really, it's... You know, with the touchscreen, I've seen a lot of articles written on saying the X-T20 for pretty much a fraction of the cost, you know, of the X-T2, and it's like 90% of the X-T2. Uh, I've seen a lot of videos on the, the autofocus tracking capability. Seems very similar. I mean, it's, I, I don't know how they, I mean, yeah, for the price point, that's just fantastic. And the really, the only reason I, you know, didn't go for that is just because it's not weather sealed. And since I'm outside all the time, uh, I like my bodies to be weather sealed. And then, you know, the X-T2 is still a little bulkier and, you know, has a nicer grip and stuff. But it's, a, yeah, the X-T20 is a fantastic option for just like an all-around family camera or a travel camera or whatever. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, uh, it's a good thing that you bring that up too because uh, uh, when we say bulky, when we're talking about uh, yeah. either the Fuji X-T2 or the uh, X-Pro2, if you are coming from any level of full frame um, or if you're um, an A7 shooter from Sony, these cameras are roughly the same size. Um, but if you need it to be ridiculously pro with the battery grip, um, you have power for all day shoots for real. But as soon as you want it to be a more travel friendly camera, you remove the battery grip. Um, and here's the thing. I really think that Fuji has done a fantastic job, uh, with those, uh, that trio of primes, the, what the 23, the 35 and the 50 F2 primes, because they are so much smaller, they're going to fit perfectly on the uh, on the XT20 or the uh, you know uh, any other interchangeable lens camera that they happen to come out with uh, if you want a lighter system you can so if you're going to be more casual that day or if you're just going to a family picnic uh, and you want to grab a couple or if you're going hiking because I do a lot of hiking and I do a lot of uh, uh, section hiking and stuff like that so having that type of camera with those smaller primes uh, would be fantastic. Maybe that and, you know, the 18 to 55 kit lens. I mean, it is good enough that I would have zero, and I do mean zero problems carrying nothing but the kit lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, the I, I own the 35 F2, um, and that's, that's probably my favorite camera to just stick on for a day of shooting if I'm just taking one camera and a lens, because that's kind of my 50 millimeter equivalent. So I'm just going to take that lens and the body, and that's what I use for shooting my daughter and for street photography stuff. I mean, it's because like you said, it's like, it's like this big and the image yeah. quality is fantastic. It's a weather sealed lens. Uh, and then of course it's complemented by the 23 and the new 50. I don't have the 50. I have the 56 1.2. Mm -hmm. uh, which is fantastic lens. I just don't use it enough. Um, what? So what? Since you're five days into the system, what lenses do you have so far? I have the kit lens and the 16 millimeter. That was the I do the 16 millimeter. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, is uh, effectively a 24 millimeter on full for, in full frame terms. Um, but because I do a lot of uh, self video, the wide angle lens. Yeah. Uh, but it also does the close focusing, and because I'm um, a camera reviewer on YouTube, I uh, at times have to take detail shots. So without going full on macro, I could get this lens, 
get a lens that is perfect for studio work for me in the YouTube channel, but it's also perfect for landscapes. It's pretty good for portraiture work. Um, it's pretty good for close focusing and taking uh, detail shots when I get new products into review. Um, so, like I said, there's a lot of useful focal ranges in the kit lens, but my next purchase is probably going to be um, either the 16 to 35, or I may just uh, go balls deep and grab the 50 to 140. Yeah, fit, I don't have the fifty one forty, but yeah, I've heard it's just a. I mean, it's an amazing lens. The sharpness. It's I, I heard it was just a beast. Uh, now I do have the sixteen to fifty five, and I don't know if you can see that. This one kind of surprised me with how big and bulky it is. I mean, it's really, yeah. really big. But uh, yeah, the the image quality, the sharpness of this thing is ridiculous. I mean, it's it's so good. I own the ten to twenty four for landscapes, and. The 10 to 24 is a great lens, but I almost always still just use the 16 uh, to 55 because it's it's just still so good. I mean, at anywhere like f5.6, f8, f11, it's just flawless. It's so good. Um, but so as far as what needs to be improved as a landscape photographer, I'd say the biggest thing uh, for me is probably the ISO, like a, a base level of 100 or lower like natively would be fantastic just so I, cause I think that's probably their quickest way to improving the dynamic range and dynamic range might not be huge for most people, but when, you know, when you're in landscape situations, high contrast lighting all the time, right. uh, highlight shadow recovery at a, a clean render is everything. And so my, that's still probably my favorite thing about the D810 is that it shoots natively at 64. And right, I'm right. so 64 that I, I mean, the, I can lift the shadows like two or three stops and it'd just be almost flawless. So yeah, if they did like a base ISO of, of 100, um, that would be fantastic to increase the dynamic range another half a stop or so. And then well, the wireless communication, I think could use some work. Yeah. And I, I've, since they, since they released the, the latest firmware update, I've, I've heard a lot of people talking about that wireless tethering that was not so good. Yeah. Um, but I will say that increasing the dynamic range, um, because they have that DR optimization setting, um, yeah. I usually, if I'm doing those landscapes like yesterday, I, I went right to the 400% to help me get a little bit extra dynamic range between the highlights and the clouds and the darkness in the trees on the, on the landscape. Yeah. Um, and it really did help out quite a bit, even in the JPEGs. Um, I was, ridiculously blown away um but yeah those are a couple things that i'd like to see improved on it as far as um you know things that i've encountered that i was kind of like eh you know that could be just a little bit better but as far as high iso i don't think that too many people realize how how non-often that you ought to shoot above certain levels i mean you know light you're seeing appropriately um, take the time to, to make it look good. You know, if right. it's not lit right, you know, that's part of your job as a photographer. You can't completely and totally rely on the sun to do all of the work for you. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that, I mean, that really comes into play when you're talking about like the, the wedding and event photographers, but what, what's still funny to me to watch is that, you know, that there were people shooting weddings with the X-T1. There were people shooting weddings with the Canon 5D original, the Mark I. Right. So, so many people, you know, as cameras evolve, it's funny to see that, you know, if you really stop and think about it, weddings don't change. It's just the cameras that change. So you can, you can still shoot weddings, you know, with, with those older cameras because people were doing it. It's really about technique and knowing when to, you know, how to use your camera settings, how to leverage the light that you have, if you're going to introduce speed lights or not. And I, I talk about this a lot with printing as well, because I do a, a fair amount of printing. And it's, I, I did a video, a pretty popular video about this, like what is one of my first videos. And uh, what, what drives me crazy is that people think that like you have to have like some insanely high resolution to make a 20 by 30 print and but, you like, don't. A 20 by 30 print 10 years ago was still a 20 by 30 print and we weren't using 40 megapixel cameras, you know, exactly. So, it, it's all, you know, it's all about, again, technique, making sure the image is tack sharp. How do you prep it in Photoshop? Do you have a good print lab, you know, a good printer, paper, all that comes into it. But, you know, you can make a, a good 20 by 30 print with 12 megapixels. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what I keep. I mean, I've told people that for the longest time I've said, you know, th there were lots of photographers that were putting their stuff up on billboards and they were shooting with 12 megapixel digital back, you know, resolution cameras and that was all they had yep. and it was still working no one noticed it no one cared uh, i think the biggest thing uh for modern day photographers is that they it's it's a rat race it's constantly trying to keep up with the other guy because if they happen to have high resolution or whatever um 
then they somehow feel like they're going to be left behind. But like you said, technique trumps that shit all day long. Um, right. Your your style has a lot to do with whether or not you get picked for the job. Um, the way you process your images has a lot to do with whether or not you get picked for the job. It's not always the gear in the bag. I don't know why people obsess so much over the spec sheet and over um, uh, the, the, the size of the camera or, or just whatever the case may be, some little nitpicky thing. Uh, it has more to do with lighting and composition than anything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that and then and then of course, you know, as a I mean, as a per, you know, as a business owner, as a person, they they really and I tell people this a lot too, they you know, gear matters to an extent and of course your your technique, but if you are if you have a good personality, you engage with people, you're you're good at marketing, uh, you're good at, at business somewhat, or at least you can pay someone to be good at business for you. You know, if, if you surround yourself with with people that can help you make your business uh I guess appeal better to the customers. Those are the people that are more likely to get the business. Cause I spent the first half of my career wondering why these guys are getting these clients. And in my opinion, their photos weren't very good. Exactly. So I'm just thinking, you know, what, what do they have? That I don't have, it would drive me crazy. And really they had amazing relationship skills. They would make, they would spend Monday through Friday, not out shooting. They would be making uncomfortable phone calls to other businesses and really marketing their work. And so there's, there's a, a balance you have to have there that, that really, you know, gets your business out there. And I'm sure I'm sure you've understood that in the past too. I mean, you have to have a portfolio and you, you know, it's all about how you market your work. So yeah, the gear is just a small portion of it. There's, there's a whole other world to how you can, you know, make yourself sellable, so to speak. Absolutely. And I think that, uh, you know, especially for new photographers just starting off, um, pick a camera, pick a system that is complete, pick a system that feels good in the hands, pick a system that you can live with, uh, pick a system that you enjoy shooting with. And then I uh, spend the least amount of time on doing that and then work your ass off on improving technique, composition, understanding lighting, and all those smaller yet ridiculously important things that most people forget. I don't care what camera you put in your hands. I mean, if you're a shit photographer, you're going to take shit pictures. Yeah. And that's just the way it goes. Yeah. And, and so an, another thing on that too, is that, uh, if there's an amazing scene in front of you, an amazing location, perfect sunset, you can stick an iPhone up in front of you and take a good photo. <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, really, yeah. So that just speaks again to, you know, the gear thing. It's really, there's, there's so much that goes into it that, you know, that's just, it, it's, it's really the photographer and your creativity. And of course, you know, the, if you have beautiful locations in front of you, it's not going to be hard to make good photographs. It's, it's finding, like for me, I live in uh, Georgia. And so there's not, you know, I have the North Georgia mountains close to me, but there's where I am, there's not a whole lot of cool places to shoot like right near my house. So I have to be creative and, and I, I do a lot of close up work or like I, there's a, I live close to a lake and I've shot this lake to death. Like I, I am surprised this lake is not trying to <laughs> swallow me whole by now. Cause I have walked every square mile of it. And, uh, it's just, it's really about working the locations that you have that. And so sometimes I'll even kind of enjoy being where I am. Cause it makes me work harder to get a good shot. And the places that have been shot to death, you know, by other people, uh, you know, you, of course, you're going to put your own kind of artistic license on it to make it different. But I kind of prefer, uh, you know, finding just different places. So like everywhere that I've ever been, uh, like a touristy location, there'll be like a group of photographers over here and I'll kind of mosey my way over here and see if there's something odd and different to shoot. And that's what really right. kind of sets you apart because you're, you know, you, you have to have, everyone has a different eye and that's always been fascinating to me because you can have a scene laid out in front of you and 15 different photographers will take 15 completely different photos. Perspective, uh, it's, man. It's, yeah, all about it's perspective. all about kind of working the location. So, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I just think that overall, the gear plays a small part, even though we're talking about Fujifilm, but you, you still have to love your gear. So, um, you know, that, that, that's also a, a huge part because if, if I didn't like, you know, being with my camera all the time, then it wouldn't feel like, cause my hobby is pretty much my job. So it wouldn't feel like this. It would feel like I'd have to go to work every day and I don't really like, you know, the tools and the genre of my photography. So, um, yeah, so I'm, that's why I'm kind of trying to get away from more client work and moving into landscape photography education. Cause I just love it so much. I'm passionate about it. I agree. Um, I wanted to give a couple, a couple more comments cause we've got a lot of them. Uh, yeah, Nick, Nick says, hello from Greece. I would like to ask you, uh, does your X-T2 get warm, uh, at the base and near the grip socket? Not hot, warm. Is it normal? Uh, I come from a DSLR Nikon and it just seems strange. Um, 
I've noticed a little bit of warmth uh, if I'm shooting for a long time or if I happen to start doing 4K video or something like that. Um, but I will say that, you know, if you uh, are familiar with the Sony system, I have yet to have this camera overheat. And I was out in the 80 degree sun all day yesterday and I shot 4K video for as long as I wanted and as many photographs as I wanted. Uh, by the way, that electronic shutter in extremely bright situations, fantastic. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the... Uh... Uh, I would say the same. I've, I mean, I've noticed it gets warm because uh, right now it's just beginning to be summer here. And so it's like the mid 90s where I live and it's humid. And so, it, I mean, I get hot. The camera gets hot, but it's never like I've never been scared that it's going to you know, crap out on me. The, it's never overheated. It's never shut off or it's never bugged out. But, yeah, it gets warm. And then, of course, you know, when you're shooting video, any any camera will get you know warm. But again, it's never I've I've recorded. Uh, like three or four back-to-back 30-minute -back 4K sequences with this thing, and it's never given me any issue. Of course, it was a little warm, but it wasn't like you know, it was so hot that I couldn't pick it up. But it's it's it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's never let me down. Yeah, that's basically been my experience too. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of stuff's going on in these brand new cameras because they are uh, electronic viewfinders and they've got really strong processing uh, uh, engines inside. It's going to generate heat, and because they are a smaller form factor, um, that heat has to dissipate somewhere. And the first place it's going to land is in your hand. So, um, but as of yet, and I'll, I promise I will report if I ever have any issues, but no one is reporting overheating issues with these cameras. And they've been out for a very long time. The Sony A9 has been out for literally a week and it's already getting reports that it's overheating. So I yeah. apologize. I'm, I feel really bad for you, A9 guys. You paid a lot of money for your camera and I am, phew, uh, like I, the overheating thing Sony has packed so much tech into their cameras, and I think that's the draw, and it was for me, for a lot of photographers to Sony, but they've got so much in there, and the body size just does not accommodate um, well enough to dissipate that heat, so... Yeah, it's okay though because the A9 Mark II should be out next week. I think <laughs> <laughs> that's what I've heard. It's, I think it's a rumor. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, we ought to check the rumor websites and do another yeah. video. Yeah. Um, Manny, yeah, I, Manny have, I, mean, I have nothing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, my bad. Uh, I was just going to say Manny Oritz. Do you ever watch his channel? Uh, no, I don't. Manny is fantastic photographer. Uh, he does great work. Uh, he says, I appreciate the Fuji experience, but I'm just a full frame kind of guy. And, you know, I know, I know that there's a lot of people that said that because I used to say that. And I'm sure that Eric probably said that at one, uh, at one point too. But if you haven't picked up the Fuji yet, if you've not, laid your hands on it i would say at least give everything a try at least once um yeah. because if you don't open yourself up to an, uh, a new experience you'll never have a new experience right and and at the end of the day you know if for the people that don't like it if you're still a full frame kind of guy so what then that's that you're a full frame kind of guy and that's fine you know that again it's it's about the right tool for the job so you know we we both love the fujifilm cameras as tons of people do but you know if you if you prefer another system I, you know, this, that's where the gear war thing comes in. I'm not going to beat you up about it every, you know, if, if you like Sony, I have no, I have nothing against Sony. Um, I, I think that, you know, I've seen a lot of people say this, that as you know, we always like, I actually kind of like that Sony kind of makes the first move on a lot of things because it, it really pushes, at least it, it, it may not push it, uh, push the industry forward for them as much because they might have to, you know, make the first failures, but it makes the other people at least think, oh, hey, that's possible to put in maybe our next line of cameras or, you know, people are liking this or not liking this. And at least it shows the industry that it can be done, even mm -hmm. if it wasn't done correctly. And so at least you know it's possible and something to look forward to. Yeah. And I think that that was probably the, uh, the second thing that really sold me on the Fuji system was the fact that they did, in fact, have phase detect. Uh, which is very uh, usable uh, in comparison to, say, like the Sony cameras. Um, also very comparable to, like, uh, Canon's uh, cross-type autofocus system as well. So, Yeah, and, you know, one thing, I don't know if you've played around with this at all, one thing that's not mentioned enough is the, the autofocus uh, during video. It's actually quite impressive. Oh, um, it impressed the shit out of me. I mean, yeah. I was like, okay, okay, I, this, is, this is a viable option for me right now. So yeah. that was the reason and, I considered it. 
That's right, because the the biggest like marketing gimmick, well, not really a gimmick, because it works well, but the biggest thing on the market for video autofocus has been the the Canon dual pixel, you know, thing on the 70D and the 80D, right? And uh, like every vlogger in the world uses those. But I was I was really impressed that the Fujifilm didn't do the whole like jittery focus thing of the DSLR. It was a really buttery smooth transition. So right. uh, it's actually a a good option for a 4K vlogging camera. Yeah, and that was um, that was also another thing too is that. Some of these camera companies, they do market uh, as having market themselves as having extremely fast autofocus. But uh, and while they do uh, in video mode, there's that constant breathing, that hunting, that that jitter. It, a lot of people call it nervous uh, autofocus. This camera doesn't really have that at all. I don't notice that slight jitter in the background where the light just kind of pulses. There's no pulsing uh, that I've been able to detect thus far. And I've uh, the only time that I get any sort of odd uh, image. Uh, you know, aberrations or whatever is generally in, uh, you know, indoor lighting where it's either like an LED or something. I'll get the banding. Uh, and, yeah. and in that case, I'll just turn off the electronic shutter and I'm good to go. That's right. Exactly. Um, yeah. And the, do you have more questions coming in? Oh, yeah. I got to shit. Yeah, yeah, go, yeah. Fire away. <laughs> <laughs> um, C Web 1988 says, I want uh, that 60 millimeter uh, F1.4 for Sony as well as that uh, 1.2 portrait lens. Uh, well, I mean, I hope you get it. Yeah, I mean, I really do. I, I'm, I've literally, I've got all of my Sony lenses uh, that I was going to sell sold except for one, and the last one I've got is the uh, 50 millimeter f1.8, uh, and it'll be gone in roughly five days. <laughs> um, okay, and then Pierre says uh, it seems like Sony uh, just want uh, the best tech in their cameras, where Fuji creates cameras for photographers. I agree. I'm um I'm kind of on board with that as well. I mean, uh, I, I I mean I'm as much of a tech nerd as I am a photographer. And while I love the tech, at the end of the day, if I can't get the shot that I want because Sony is not making the lenses that I need, I have to I had to start looking elsewhere. So, yeah. um, Chad says, "What's going on, boys? Uh, I think I'm going back to Nikon full frame. A lot of Fujifilm gear though. Just missed the depth of field. Wish Fuji made full frame." Do you uh, let me ask you, do you miss it at all when you're using your Fuji? Do you go, damn, this this picture would have just been marginally better had I only had my full frame camera? So that that's probably a tough question for me because I may the, the the portraits that I shoot are mainly of like friends and family. I don't do uh weddings and stuff anymore. But from what I remember, I mean I the the 35 f2 the 56 1.2 even the 16 to 55 2.8 is perfectly fine for me but if you're watching this video i will urge you that to to think that whenever someone says you know it has really great bokeh or really fast autofocus that's always different to every person as to what fast it's very it's and, very relative yeah, yeah absolutely yeah so um for me i don't i don't miss it on that point that you know but again i'm mainly a landscape photographer so the biggest thing that i would say i don't really miss but the biggest difference I notice is the dynamic range on the D810 is like the best I've ever seen. And then the Fuji X-T2 is one of the best I've ever seen as far as mirrorless goes. It's very good. But yeah, the, for me, the biggest thing I would say that, that I notice from my full frame to that is the dynamic range, which is, I mean, it's, you know, it's noticeable because the D810 is a, a beast of a camera. It but really is. It's not enough to make me go back to that full time and carry that in my bag all the time because I love shooting with the Fujifilm. That 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 is one of Nikon's biggest selling points. Is in fact its dynamic range because when you take a, a landscape with a Nikon camera, and I used to do this a lot, um, Nikon has ridiculously good dynamic range when it comes to you know rendering those highlights extremely well and re retaining detail, and then going into those shadows around the trees or the mountain range or whatever it happens to be, and still getting detail in those shadows. That's the reason a lot of people that shoot either wildlife or, or landscapes always grab for a Nikon because they're going to keep that extra detail that might otherwise have been lost. But yeah. I will say that just from my limited experience with the Fujifilm uh, X-T2, it did extremely well. I mean, I got plenty of detail in the clouds, bright front lit clouds and plenty of detail down in the shadowy areas that were backlit uh, on the trees and I, I had a lot of detail there. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, what, one thing I noticed about the X-T2 as well, that it's kind of opposite of the Nikon, is that I tend to leave my exposure compensation dial on the Fujifilm. Like constantly, I leave it overexposed by maybe like a third of a stop or a two-thirds of a stop because yes. the highlights yes. recover so good. 
and I just like to kind of more so expose for the shadows. But that's opposite to what I've always done with Nikon. I've always exposed for the highlights and lifted the shadows. But right. the highlights recover so good on the X-T2, or at least, yeah, specifically the X-T2 raw files. I haven't played around with the X-T20 or, or the X-Pro2, but it, it's just so good that I pretty much always leave it overexposed just a little bit. And I don't know if that's... Um, due to the metering or you know metering system how how it exposes the scene but that tends to work good for me i just leave it just a tiny bit overexposed and we had actually talked a little bit of, uh, of about this on your live stream uh, the other day where i had actually heard that it was the reverse whereas more and more people were exposing for um uh the what was it the the shadows and it was able to retain or it was able to bring back highlight detail a lot better but um I don't know. I guess it's different, but I will say that I do think, in my personal opinion, that the Fuji does tend to underexpose by just a little bit. So I yeah. have found that I actually like it with a plus one exposure compensation on almost everything. Yep. Um, I just feel like it underexposes just a tad bit too much. Um, unless I'm already out in bright sunlight, then I'll go ahead and put it on zero and just uh, use a raw file instead. Uh, but if I'm just looking for a good JPEG, uh, especially indoors, I, I feel like it underexposes just a bit. So I usually keep it about two thirds to a full stop uh, on the exposure compensation that works out just fine for me. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see. We got Drew Rogers says, have you guys ever done any astrophotography uh, with any of the Fuji cameras? If so, how does the sensor handle? I have not, but I love astrophotography and is um, as I now have the 60 millimeter. I, I fully intend uh, to give it a go and see what I can get with it. Yeah, I uh, so I recently just got back from a trip to the the Gulf Coast a couple weeks ago, and I did some astrophotography while I was there. Um, it was the first time I've done it seriously, and I actually found that it held up really well. Um, it was I shot it with the 16 to 55 at 2.8. Um, and I think I even set up the camera on a time lapse that I could do some star trails, but I haven't blended all those together yet. But I was actually surprised with uh, it, you know, the the color, the detail, how I was able to recover it in the uh, back in the raw processor. But I also did some uh, some astrophotography with the XT1 while I was there, and that was just as impressive. So yeah, I mean, I they're they're great for it. I've you I've done astrophotography on every camera I've owned, and I haven't experienced any issues. However, I will say before you start. If you're going to do a big time lapse or a, a really, you know, a series of long exposures, uh, go into the menu system and run the pixel mapping on the camera so that you don't get those weird uh, bright white spots. You know, you're obviously going to get some hot pixel, some hot pixels in there, but there's these weird little white spots that'll tend to come up sometimes. So I, I found that when I did the pixel mapping function on the XT2, it got rid of them almost every time. Good info to have, man. Um, Lucas says. Yeah, exactly. I want to keep shooting APS-C, so Fuji was the obvious choice. Uh, I had an Olympus uh, Micro Four Thirds before. It was pretty good, too. And I've heard good things from the Olympus. I've never used them. I have used a couple of their lenses, though, uh, when I was testing out the Panasonic systems. But unfortunately, the Micro Four Thirds, for me, is just a little too small. Um, it's not that it ever produced bad images for me, so I don't want anyone to, uh, to do that. Uh, the biggest problem, again, for me was... Um, Autofocus is still contrast detect only, so that was a big deal for me. So, uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, CWeb nineteen eighty eight says, "I always shoot in RAW." Uh, is it um, is it true that RAW files don't work very well in Lightroom? Uh, from my experience, I wouldn't say that they don't work well. I just don't think that they work as good as say like Iridiate Developer. A lot of people like that one, uh, but. I don't really use all those apps anyway, man. I, I swear to God, my raw processor tends to be Apple Photos, and then anything I want to add to it later, you know, I, I just mess around with uh, as far as um, I, I love Affinity Photos. Have you tried that app yet, by the way? I have tried it, yeah. I love it's actually that app. Pretty, Yeah, it's actually really good. Um, um, and it has... Pictorial? No, I have not. Um, Pictorial is pretty good, too. But there's a lot of people that have, you know, just different little things, uh, different little apps that they like to mess around with. And uh, Affinity Photo also has a raw developer in it as well. So, um, yeah. and it's extremely cheap. I think you can get it for, I don't know, 49 bucks, no subscription. So if you happen to be a, a, a like a Photoshop user, that might be an option for you. I don't know. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I've heard of a, a lot of good things can still be rendered in Lightroom. Right. Probably just not as good as some of the other ones, but you know, I'm not a huge Adobe fan anyway. I, th I think their software is a little bloated for me. Yeah, the one of my friends is a, a social media manager, and he does he shoots with the A6000, 
um, for his work. And he, he says that, so he uses Apple photos as well. And he really likes the DXO plugins. Yes. That you can get for Apple photos. Do you use those at all? He I, loves them. I, I don't. Um, but I have used them before. I've also used the Google, uh, well, it's, it's now Google, the Google Nick, yeah. uh, especially for black and whites, their, their silver effects plugin is just off the hook. It is. It's fantastic. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, Lauren says, what new lenses can we expect from Fuji? That's a good question. And I also wanted to hit on that as well. Um, right now, uh, see, I, I like wide angle lenses a lot. Um, and I almost decided to go with like their 10 to 24, but I had heard that Fuji had in the works, um, an eight to, I think 24. Does that sound right? Or an 8 to 16, maybe? Yeah, 8, eight to 15, 8 to 16. Something. It, it's on their, they have a roadmap out for 2018. I think it's something like that on there. Which is so nice to have, knowing what is potentially going to be showing up in the lineup, being able to plan lens purchases, because Sony does not do that. Yeah. They, they don't give out that. It's like, it's like dog, y'all ain't, you're not Apple. Like, don't, what are you keeping secrets for? You got photographers that have a business to run, and this is their moneymaker. Let them know what you're coming out with. Yeah, that's that's what I've been hoping that Nikon would do recently because, of course, as a D800, D810 user, I'm yes. still going to look at the D810 replacement that's coming out, and I wish they would give us just like a little sneak peek of just something. A, like, just a little. So yeah, just a bit. Just something. Yeah. Doesn't have to be big, but I mean, having that roadmap is just so nice to to be able to plan lens purchases. Like, okay, well, I didn't really need that lens. It's not coming out till next year, so I can go ahead and start allocating money towards something else. Right. Um, let's see. Lucas also says, uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, Paul says any idea when the 80 millimeter macro lens is due for release? If I'm not mistaken, I think it's due out in 2018. I could be wrong though. I think it is 2018 though. Yeah. I'm not sure, but that we, we definitely do need a really good macro option, uh, for Fuji films right now. I've been using my, uh, one Oh five macro lens, the Nikon version with a, a photo diox or photo deox, whatever the little lens adapter. And that's actually been working really great with the focus peaking. So that's what I've been using right now is my Nikon macro. Cool. Um, and as a matter of fact, I uh, really like the uh, the focus peaking that Fuji does. It seems like, um, it, just in my experience, uh, it's a little bit better than the Sony's. The Sony's, I always feel like I still miss shots when I'm using the focus peaking. But yesterday I was taking a, a semi-macro shot with the 16 millimeter. And the focus peaking let me know exactly where I was at. And because I was in the Acros uh, film simulator, the contrast between what was peaking and the oh, yeah. actual was just, I was like, nailed it. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, I've noticed that too. The, like it, it has some kind of like, well, of course it uses contrast, but it has this weird edge detection thing where like, it just like draws a line around shapes and you know exactly right. where you're at. Yeah. It's, it's really good focus peaking. Um, Lucas says, oh, I'm sorry, wrong one again. We've got a couple people answering questions for us in here. Ah, cool. Um, let's see. Lucas says the 16 to 55 actually manages, uh, excuse me, to be sharper than the 16 millimeter prime, which is crazy. Yeah. Uh, I have no experience with it, so I don't know. Um, and you don't have any experience with the 16 millimeter, I don't guess. No, I don't. So <laughs> you don't know, but I heard it's amazing. I, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm enjoying it so far, but I have heard just like the, the, top three lenses that every working professional ought to have in their bag uh, is the 60 millimeter prime, uh, the 16 to 55 2.8 and the 50 to one four. So yeah. if you happen to be doing um, wedding work or anything, that would be your 24 to 70 and your 70 to 200 replacements. And the 16 millimeter is good for group shots uh, because of the close focusing. You can get your detail shots of like your flowers, your rings, your invitations, uh, the, the candles, just whatever. Um, and that really would be a complete system uh, yeah. for wedding photographers. Definitely. Uh, let's see. Chad says, Hey Mark, uh, can you uh, buy my 15 of 140 used at one time? Really? Wow. How much, how, how much you want for it? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I just went in debt like $3,000. I mean, I am selling like a, just a mass of stuff to help, help me pay for all this new stuff, Fuji stuff I just bought. Uh, so yeah, let me know. Uh, David P says why, or I'm sorry, Lucas says, nope, these are people answering other questions. You have a good community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boogermater says, uh, uh, yeah, Manny, Manny Ortiz. Yes, I know, man. I, I forgot. It's my bad. 
Uh, <laughs> you guys are funny. All right. Keep making fun. All right. So I actually had a comment from Chris Barr. Um, he was wondering, he says, if Fuji had IBS, uh, it would cost even more uh, compared to its competition. Because he was asking, he says, this was Chris Barr's comment, and we had kind of discussed this before, he and I, and he was asking, uh, why does the XC2 cost so much with less features compared to the Sony A6500 that costs less? I mean, I've said... I just lost uh, audio. I can't hear you anymore. Okay. How's that? I'm sorry. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. I apologize. It did it just, how much did you all hear? Uh, I only lost it for like five seconds. It just cut out real quick. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think you get a lot for your money. I mean, what do you think? Um, yeah. So it, I, again, I may, I may not be the, ne the, the best person to ask here because I come from paying, over three grand for every you know d800 or nikon dslr and so when i paid for this for the fuji i thought i mean that it was a great value for the money there's so many people that say that the fuji is really expensive and you know i guess it depends on what you're coming from i guess and what you've always kind of paid for your camera but i think that it's i mean i i wasn't complaining for the price when i got it i thought oh my gosh for half the money of what i've normally paid for cameras uh, plus the the company giving us free firmware upgrades. I thought it was just a, I mean, it's a steal of a deal. The value is amazing. And, and a nice thing compared to Sony, because I have shot Sony before, is the lenses will not like just completely break your bank. The lenses are well-priced. Yes, and here's the thing, though. You know, being an APS-C shooter uh, with Sony for a while, while they do have good enough lenses you know they all the lenses they have in their APS-C line are what i would consider what you know uh they're good enough they're but they're expecting uh, a lot of those shooters to buy full frame lenses now their full frame lenses i think are ridiculously priced i don't think that i would ever be all that interested in paying those prices not when fuji uh is making good as good if not better lenses in the APS-C line for half that price yeah, I agree. Yeah, the I was just so impressed with the price. I mean, because even like the the sixteen to fifty five, I think around Christmas time when I got all the gear, I paid like a thousand dollars for the sixteen to fifty five two point eight. And when I got my Nikon twenty four to seventy, it was like nineteen hundred bucks. And it was like how most of my lenses were. And it's yeah, it's the and then of course I, I at that point when I first got it, I didn't know what the lens quality was going to be like. And all the image quality tests I've done, like I said earlier, it's you're going to be hard to find a bad Fuji lens. I mean, I haven't found one yet. They're all really really good. I think the only one that I think uh, that most people have a consensus on is like the eighteen is not so good. But yeah. then again, I've also read fantastic reviews saying that it is just a workhorse of a wide angle because a it's really small b it's really light and a lot of people are willing to overlook some of the uh image quality imperfections i suppose just because of those those facts yeah so uh let's see c web at 1988 says basically if fuji could do ibis uh then they'd have the whole cake and i agree i would really like to see in body image stabilization but i don't think that most people realize that the kit lens has optical image stabilization. You yeah. all don't realize how good this goddamn kit lens is until you yeah. actually use it. It's ridiculously good. It is. Yeah. So I don't know how, I don't know where I stand on IBIS just because um, there's just something, and I don't know if it's me being slightly OCD, but there's just something that I can't sit right with about knowing that my sensor is shifting on the inside of my camera. I don't know how I, I just don't know how, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with IBIS cameras. I did own the Sony a7 II for a short while. I just don't know how that, I don't know if there's been enough like research on if that affects image quality at all. Cause I mean, if you think about the sensor aligning to the lens on a shifting axis, I don't know how that would affect image quality. So, you know, well, that's not a requirement for me. Well, let me go ahead and put your mind at, at rest. I mean, if the system is implemented well, um, I, I tested out the Panasonic. Well, and of course I've tested out the, uh, a 6,500. Um, but is like on the Panasonic system, uh, they have both image stabilization in the lens and in body. I was able to get handheld down to a fifth of a second sharp images. So, okay, 
cool. If that, if that tells you anything. Yeah, you're, you're more experienced with that than I am. I haven't shot with a lot of IBIS, but for me specifically, it's not a requirement. I know for event shooters, I'm sure it'd be something that, that would be phenomenal to their workflow. But uh, Chris Barr says if Fuji had, uh, it would cost even more compared to his competition. You know, Chris, I, I, I really, like, I realized that, you know, you're, you're pretty dead set on what you've got with Sony is, is great. And the, the A6500 is a fantastic camera. Um, the thing of it is, is that if you've ever used any other type of camera, uh, whether that was a, a DSLR where you had some level of external control where you were able to quickly and efficiently change your settings and move right onto the next shot, and then again, quickly change your settings, being able to change your metering mode, being able to ch your, uh, uh, change your drive mode, all those things, being able to do that in very fast, rapid you know, custom bank settings. Like we've got what on the Fuji, like seven or eight uh, custom bank settings where you can yeah. literally with the quick menu move from one lighting scenario right into another one and have all of your settings already changed for that specific one. So you can set up custom bank one to low light reception photography or whatever, and then immediately swap to the other one where it's out in the, you know, the, uh, like, like a sunset situation where you you're backlighting your subjects and you're trying to, it's just convenience. That's yeah. what it boils down to. It boils down to convenience run and gun with this many controls, this level of custom, uh, customizability. Um, I mean, it just works and it's so much of a joy to use. It makes it really hard to go. Oh yeah. I really like diving down into menus every single time I want to change something. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I've, because a lot of people, um, when I first got this, because I, I, I wrote a, a big long review about the X-T2, and I said one of the things that I really wanted to be improved on it was the the autofocus tracking isn't the best if you're just in like a default mode. You have to go into the AFC custom settings and kind of tweak some stuff. Um, but I have it assigned to my function button right here. So if I'm, you know, literally if I'm about to shoot fast action, I press one button and it opens up all my settings. I don't have to dive through 15 menus, you know, to get there. It's just right there at my fingertips. And then the most recent firmware update, they added this little back command dial, uh, as you know, as a custom function button. So now that can be your back button focus. And it's just a little bigger and easier for the thumb to hit. It's a little more centered. So I actually changed that uh, rear command dial over to my back button focus now. And so I don't have to kind of reach far right or left for the AEL AFL buttons. Yeah. Um, and, and that was, uh, another, uh, big perk to picking up a Fuji camera was the fact that not only is this thing just full of buttons and external manual controls, but you can assign almost anything to any button, you know, and yeah. when it comes to moving over into movie mode, because I know we've got a lot of video shooters and stuff. Um, the shutter button is the record button and I've got it, you know, with a nice big red, you know, button on there, you know, that's my record button. There's no weird off to the side, little recess button that I can barely reach and have to take my camera away from my face in order to get to. I mean, it's simple little, uh, design choices that increase the usability of a camera that makes it worth it. And as Eric was talking about earlier, moving, you know, or being uh, accustomed to a big bulky DSLR that also has a lot of buttons, you shave weight, you shave size, and you shave that bulk. So if you can get all the functionality in a smaller form factor that's also mirrorless, that has an amazing electronic shutter with all of those uh, external controls, knobs, wheels, and buttons, you know, it really makes a compelling argument for someone that has used multiple systems and knows the benefits of having a lot of external controls and also knows the pitfalls of always having to dive down into a menu. Right. Yeah. That's, that's so like I said earlier at the beginning, I first bought the Fuji camera to go on a vac like a vacation as a travel camera. And I originally bought it with just a couple lenses and I bought it as like, I kind of talked myself into it as like a lightweight option. And like I said, when I got back, I have the, the battery grip and the, the huge 16 to 55 lens and an L bracket on it. So this thing probably weighs as much as my D810, but it's, you know, it's, it's no longer about lightweight. It's really just about the camera. I mean, just performing well, being versatile. But the best thing about it, as far as the versatility, is that if I wanted to, you know, I could strip down the battery grip, the L bracket, put on a smaller lens, and now I do have a tiny little, like, almost pocketable camera. You know, the 35 F2 Prime without a battery grip, it's a tiny camera again. It's a ridiculously tiny camera. Yeah. Um, Eric Rossi. Hey, how's it going, Eric? Hey, nice I know Eric Rossi. Well, I don't know him, but I know his channel. Yeah, uh, he's, he's, he's good pal. Um, 
he says Nikon owns most of the still side image quality wise, severely lacking uh, on some focusing speed and video options, but still side Nikon is near the top. I would agree. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Cweb1998 says, dude, Nick collection is baller. And it really is. I mean, especially for a free set of plugins. I mean, yeah. it's really hard to beat. Yeah. Well, here, well, here's the cool thing. So I paid full price for the Nick collection. Uh, like a long time ago. And then when Google decided to make it free, I just got a random refund one day. I was like, what? <laughs> what? And then, yeah. And then I still got to use it for free. It was, it was awesome. That's pretty, that's pretty nice of them. Yeah. Um, James, uh, a photography says I sold my X-T2 because the continuous focusing in low light was no match for the D750. Uh, then the update came out. Is it vastly better now? Oh man, that's a, that's a rough one. Cause I don't do a whole lot of low light shooting. I mean, most of my stuff is, Fairly well lit. I guess I could test it out. Maybe you can shed some insight. Um, what, what camera was he talking about? Um, he said that he sold his XC2 because uh, the low light performance was no match for his D750, which is Nikon. Oh, yeah, so I might somewhat agree there. The D750 is one of Nikon's fastest focusing cameras right now. Is if you're looking at you know not not the D500 and the D5, it's it is pretty fast. It's even faster than the D810. Uh, but yeah, low light acquisition is is a thing that I was worried about when I moved to the XT2. When they did the first wave of firmware up, uh, updates on this a couple months back, uh, I would say that it improved drastically. I didn't think it was actually going to improve that well. And I've shot in easily negative two EV, negative three EV situations, and it is not it's not as fast as it is in obviously broad daylight, but it's not slow. I mean, it's I would say that it's faster than my D810. So if that gives you an idea. Um, and I think that a lot of people would probably not compare it to the D810. D810 is really good for, like you said, landscapes, slow moving stuff. It's more of a, uh, a studio style camera. The 750 is just a really great camera in general. Um, I'm not going to say that uh, mirrorless is anywhere close to that camera yet, but I will say that I've had little to no problems focusing in any lighting situation that I've been in thus far. So until I find a, a hard wall uh, that I don't think that I could get past, um, which has not been as of yet, then I, I'm going to say that it's pretty damn good. Yeah. Better yeah. better than most. I'll, I'll say that. Better than most. Yeah, that's what I would say. Because I, I don't know yeah specific comparison with the D750 because I, I have shot with the D750 some. But yeah, the, the low light autofocusing on the X-T2 is the best mirrorless I've ever used. I'll say that. Yeah, um, the only thing that I think that uh, the Fuji uh, X-T2 lacks on as of yet is for me, uh, because I'm a YouTuber and I, I take a lot of self-video all the time, uh, I hate the, the app that if I use the app and I record video with it, it always does it in 720p. I don't understand yes. why that wh why that's even a thing. Like that, it, it bothers does with my me mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, if they ever fix that shit, I mean, I'm going to be... Uh, a really, really happy camper. I um, agree. Uh, Chris uh, Sifford says, camera store is lowballing me 750 for that lens. I will part ways with it for a thousand. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good. That's what, a $200 savings? Yeah. <laughs> um, of course, Fuji has sales a lot, you know. Uh, let's see. James A. Photographer says, uh, cheers for all your input, guys, uh, by the way. Thank you very much, man. Uh, Chris Barr says, Sony has free firmware updates. Yeah, so does Fuji. Like, yeah. What's your point? <laughs> well, I would call Fuji firmware, I would call them firmware upgrades. Upgrades, because I get, uh, if, if you look at the list of improvements, I mean, when they include all that shit in one firmware update, it's like getting a brand spanking new camera. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, just a bunch of fun new features to play with like the the face tracking and the eye tracking autofocus actually really improved i mean since the last firmware update i can really tell the difference me too uh yeah. when i first got it i still had the the firmware update uh that was prior to 2.0 um mm -hmm. and the focusing was not that good i was like oh man i have made a mistake here uh and then i immediately upgraded it to the 2.0 world of difference and i was just like now it's a viable option yeah well, and especially in low light, the, the low light focus has come a long way with the firmware upgrades. Absolutely. Um, Air Crossy says uh, Sony and Fuji, uh, Fuji especially, are tops with firmware updates. And I would agree. Um, Sony doesn't do 
as many firmware updates as I would like them to, because there's a lot of stuff that I know that they could include in these older cameras. But I do think to a large extent that they are kind of, at least this is how it's leaning from my point of view, that they are leaning more towards the, we would rather release a new camera than release new firmware. And I don't really particularly like that because it's software stuff in a lot of cases that they're adding to. So just release it, give your loyal fan base that, that, that shot in the ass that they're going to keep talking about your cameras. Don't, don't, uh, don't F them over. Like you kind of did me with the a 6300, then releasing the 6,500 a few months later. Yeah. I agree. It's, it's, it's unnecessary. Right. Definitely. Um, Bill silver or Ben Silverstein says, are there any flash transceivers for the Fuji EG Godox Photix? Yeah, there's plenty of them. Uh, as a matter of fact, everything that I've tried, uh, thus far works. So, I mean, even cheap third party flashes and trigger systems will work. Maybe not TTL and maybe not high speed sync, but I do know that the cactus system does, uh, at least high speed sync. And I know that the Godox or no, not the Godox, but the Nissan system just yeah. released high speed sync as well. Yeah, I have the Nissan i60A with the Air Commander, and I haven't uh, sent it back for the high-speed sync upgrade yet. But the TTL and the wireless communication, it's, it's great. Fantastic. That's that, that's a uh, that's good to know because I've been debating on which is. I honestly, I thought that Godox was going to beat uh, everyone else to the punch as far as high-speed sync went because they've they've been doing a pretty good job of filling in the gap where Sony won't release anything, uh, you know, high-speed sync wise. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I'll definitely be looking into the uh, the Nissan system really soon. Um, okay. And, uh, raw gray sun says, uh, I hear that, uh, a 200 F2 is coming. Do you know anything about that? Uh, yeah, I think I read that on Fuji rumors, but I'm not, I'm not sure if it was a rumor or if it was on the roadmap. So I, I can't confirm that. Okay. Uh, Chris Barr says the uh, Sony also has save settings that can be accessed with the function button straight to those save settings. Yeah. And, and they do. And they also have two custom uh, function buttons on the a6500 on the top which was a extremely nice addition uh they also have two memory recall settings on the dial which is fantastic for uh swapping between two highly used uh scenario settings um but chris the the thing is is that you've not used the fuji system so like i'm not in any way trying to be a dick i'm just saying that you don't have any experience with the fuji system so it's very hard for you to draw delineations between what makes a camera more fun between the two systems without trying one of them um so uh cweb 1998 says having the aperture on the lens seems like it could get really annoying to me though i feel like i change it all the time accidentally do you do you have any problems with that uh no i actually actually quite like it um uh, it's the, the aperture rings are really, I mean, they're, they have good resistance to it. I think you'd probably agree. They're not, it's not like you can just like brush up against it and it changes the aperture. So, um, I find that while I'm zooming, sometimes it can get a little weird if I want to, you know, just switch back and forth. I sometimes on certain lenses, I'll have a hard time kind of distinguishing the zoom from the aperture ring, but most of the aperture rings are very pronounced and kind of uh, rigid like this one on the 16 to 55 and the, I mean it's a super simple just back and forth so yeah I haven't had any problem going with the aperture ring on the lens um I, I thought my biggest problem was gonna have to be reaching up here for the ISO I thought when I was like here I, I wouldn't like you know doing this but it's actually it's it's fine it's been the mechanical dial thing I've gotten used to and it's a it's a welcome addition in my opinion I like it well, and especially if you have any experience with old manual cameras in general uh if you ever shot film you know for the most part, you would set your ISO once, you set it to 400, and then everything else would be changed. So uh, if you are already into that habit, or if you're not, and uh, you're kind of out of practice with your film cameras, you know, just set it to a, a relatively nice setting, depending on what situation you're going into. And then just, uh, you, you can basically, like on these lenses, they have an A setting. I don't know if you all can see that there. They have an A setting which you put that in auto mode, you can set your shutter speed to auto, and then you would effectively be uh, in like aperture priority or shutter priority. Or if you put everything in A, then you're in program mode. So you don't actually need an A uh, SP dial on here whatsoever. Yeah. Um, because you have those functions built in just depending on how you set your aperture ring, your shutter speed and your ISO. So you can have all those functions uh, without actually having dedicated settings on a switch. 
Yeah, that's a good point. Because well, a, a lot of people wonder if you can do like aperture priority, shutter priority with the Fuji cameras. And you can, it's just not on a, a mode dial. You just simply switch the, each setting into automatic for whichever one you're going to do. Exactly. So, you know, if you like aperture priority, you're a wedding shooter. A lot of wedding shooters uh, want to be an aperture priority. You just set your shutter speed or your ISO to automatic and you can have up to three different custom settings. So you can set it to, you know, all right, I, I want the ISO to never go above 1600 on the first setting. I want it to never go above 3200 in the other one. And I want it to never go above 6400 in the other one. It's not just an all or nothing kind of situation. So um, you just set your ISO to a range, you set your shutter speed to a range, and then you're in aperture priority mode. So uh, very, very convenient. Definitely. Um, Chris Barr said, or not Chris Barr, uh, CWeb1988 says, oh, shit, it was Chris Barr. <laughs> uh, all it takes is uh, taking some time to set up uh, the camera the proper way that when you first get it. He's talking about the uh, Sony a6500. Uh, Michael Quintero says, hi, Eric and Mark. I'm seriously considering selling my uh, a6300, the 18-105 to f4, and the Sigma 30mm f1.4 uh, to get the X-T2 or, uh, yeah, the X-T2 for my mirrorless option. Uh, Y'all's has been instrumental in swaying me. See, we're influencers. There you go. Cool. <laughs> um, I, I tell you what, I, and I say this to everyone every single time, don't sell anything and don't get rid of anything until you have tried the camera out for yourself. Rent it. Uh, go to a store and play with it. Uh, buy it and off Amazon. And if you don't like it, send it back. Do whatever you got to do. Uh, but put it in your hands and put it in the situations that you're going to find yourself in the most with because swapping systems is no easy task. I mean, it is a pain in the dick and you don't want to be stuck with a system that you don't like when you had something that you were perfectly comfortable with just a few seconds ago. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. I think there's, I think in the, the photography industry, there's like, I would kind of put it into like three categories of shooters. I would say that there's like the photographers, maybe professionals that, that just know what they want and they know what they don't want and that's it. And then there's kind of like the floaters that kind of float around the different systems until they find one, or maybe they're never really settled on one. And there's the people that are just um, uneducated, but not in a mean way. They just, they're just kind of new to the industry and trying to find their way. And yeah, the, you know, there's a lot of good information on YouTube and blogs, but the, the thing I always tell people, you're always going to end up finding what you want to find. So like if, if you, you know, if, if in the, if like deep in your mind, you really want Sony or Fuji or whatever, you're going to end up finding that blog or that YouTube channel that really hits on that one thing. And then you're going to convince yourself to go that way. It's so confirmation really, bias every single time. I mean, right. if you buy something, you want people to confirm that you have made uh, a, a fantastic decision with that, that purchase. Exactly. But that is the wrong way to approach it. So don't do that. You cannot, you have to find the videos and the blogs and, and the reviews that talk about the negatives, because those are going to be the things that are, are really going to suck for your workflow. So figure out if any of those stumbling blocks for other photographers are actually stumbling blocks for you. Yeah. Look, look for patterns. If you see like multiple blogs and YouTube, channels talking about the same positive or negative, you know, that'll tell you something. But like you said, the most important thing, get it in your hands, play with it in your genre of photography. And I mean, that will tell you more than. Uh, let's see. Ben Silverstein says, wow, I paid for uh, Nick too. I'm going to ask for a refund. Thanks. No problem. <laughs> Uh, Eduardo says the app problem um, is the same type of Wi-Fi protocol. The transmission speed is only usable for video in 720p. Um, yeah, and, and I realize that as far as like the Fuji system goes, I, I realize that the transmission is only in 720p, but that shouldn't affect the recording quality in camera. Correct. So, you know, trans, you know, you know, fuck, stream it to me in 480. I don't care. Just record it in 4K in the camera. Yeah. Um, let's see. Chad says, if uh, size wasn't an issue for you, D500 or X-T2? Oh, man. Um, I'm not a sports shooter, really. I, I don't need that level of uh, fast performance that the D500 offers. And I find that the X-T2 uh, is perfectly fast with the battery grip. I mean, I, I get 14 frames per second. The electronic shutter allows me to slow my uh, shutter speed down to 32 thousandths of a second. So if I want to shoot directly into the sun, I got whatever I need as far as performance goes. Um, the D500 is an optical viewfinder and it's not mirrorless. So I'm full mirrorless at this point. So the yeah. X-T2 would be the clear choice for me. 
Yeah, I would say the biggest thing to look at there if he's trying to decide is the buffer because the buffer on the D500 will go for days. You can just crank the shutter and it just doesn't stop. The X-T2 does have buffer limitations if you're going to do nothing but sports. Right, so, and, yeah. and, and that's the biggest delineation. If you are a sports shooter uh, and you have to catch that decisive moment, uh, I would 100% recommend the D as a matter of fact i would recommend both of them if you've got the the cash buy both of them you know um if you only shoot sports sometimes and you absolutely need it for say like work um get it and then as far as like your fun camera your slower uh your slower shoots like weddings or portraits or whatever the case may be the xt2 renders so beautifully for those types of situations i don't think you can go wrong with either one yeah, I, I own, like, I, I I never switched from Nikon. I still own my D810. And I love having the Nikon system and the Fuji system, and they both, you know, work in different situations. And I don't I don't plan on selling my Nikon stuff, so I like having both. It's a good option. Absolutely, and I mean, I've not sold my Sony cameras. I, I, I've, I've picked out a few lenses that I absolutely love on my Sony system, and I'm planning to just hold on to it because it's gotten me through. If I ever get to a point where the, the Fuji system is satisfying all my needs and I'm never picking up that, those cameras ever again fine no big deal I'll, I'll go ahead and sell it yeah um okay uh dp chris says fuji bodies are 10 times better built than sony i will agree um i don't know um how well the a9 is built i mean i hear that it's magnesium alloy i know that the a7 cameras are magnesium alloy um but i will say that the fuji xt2 is built like an effing tank i mean it's it's strong as can be uh, Pierre says, uh, why is there no Sigma lenses, uh, compatible with Fuji mount? I was looking at that exact same thing. I don't know why. Maybe it's just not popular enough. Sony kind of exploded there really fast. And a lot of people started picking it up. I think that's probably one of the reasons why Sigma, uh, had picked up on it. But the, if you're an APS-C uh, size Sony shooter, um, bad news, Sigma is not going to be putting out any more e-mount glass it's only ef from here on out e ef and i believe they're still going to be producing some a mount glass um lucas says uh, the real map says that a new wide angle zoom and i believe that's the 18 or the uh 8 to 16 which i'm extremely interested in especially if it ends up being an f 2.8 um yeah. that'll be awesome um and a new telephoto prime for 2018 which i believe is going to be the 200 that, that we were talking about earlier uh, speculation has it that it's an 8 to 16 and a 200 f2 that's right um let's see here only got a few more chris bar says i used an xt2 for two weeks uh before i took it back because uh of the i don't know what that is it just did not focus good and no eye autofocus uh at the time that i had it i shoot 90 percent family portraits uh for clients and um, the a6500 just did better at the time of purchase. And I think you should get whatever works best for you. I mean, I don't care what you shoot with, you know, I, I hope that you get every single shot that you've ever wanted to take with the camera that you bought. And I would never encourage someone to sell all their shit to go buy something else just because I really like it. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Um, but I will say that the, the new, <laughs> the firmware update for the X-T2, the teeny tiny focus point now is much better for portrait photographers to put it right over the eyeball. So that's actually a really nice addition. But I will say that he is right as far as, um, if you have a moving bride, um, that eye autofocus tracking is just, I mean, it's a damn nice feature to have for real. Mm -hmm. Um, Pierre says, or oh, I'm sorry, uh, Lucas says. Nope, they're all talking to each other. Uh, Chris Barr says, uh, with shooting kids, I need high frames per second, uh, very fast autofocus, very fast face tracking, and having eye autofocus out of the gate uh, was all it took to get the Sony. And I, Yeah, I mean, those specific needs are an extremely good reason to get one of those Sony cameras because the A6500, for its size and its weight, I mean, is just there's really not much else out there that compete that can compete with its burst with its buffer depth and that eye autofocus if you're doing kids or 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 pets being able to do that back button uh lock on autofocus i mean it's a dream come true for real um Ben says, and I know it's pricey, but the Sony A9 is awesome. Uh, 242 shots at 20 frames per second continuous before the buffer fills up. More than you'll ever need. Too bad it's 4,500. Um, <clears throat> you're only going to get that. I mean, it, 
there is a caveat to everything, brother. Uh, the 20 frames per second is with the electronic shutter only. If you have to use mechanical shutter because you're in some sort of odd lighting situation, you get five frames. That's it. So you better hope that your lighting situation is always ideal. And I mean, that's just now coming out, but all of the test uh, shots that they had in New York uh, when the A9 launched, they were already all pre-lit in a big domed area with big, nice skylights and all that kind of stuff. It, they were pre-planned shots. Uh, if you were to go into any shitty little venue for a wedding and you were looking to burst something down and make sure that you got that shot, you better pray that they didn't have fluorescent lighting in that venue or you're going to get banding in every shot and none of it is going to be usable. Yep, I agree. So that's where you grab a D500 instead of a, and, and it's half the cost. So, yeah. and uh, I'll note also that it's not just Sony cameras. That's the same with Fujifilm and just Absolutely. electronic shutter. That's just Absolutely. electronic shutter. Yeah. It, that's just the tech. So it's not, it's not the camera's fault. It's not Sony's fault. It's just the nature of the frequency of the light in combination with the frequency of your electronic shutter. That's right. Um, okay. And just a few more. Uh, I guess only Fujifilm focus on APS-C, most non-brand Sigma, et cetera, will struggle beating the quality of Fujinon, uh, but I wish uh, they would try. I agree. Uh, I think more options is a good thing, always. I never I never encourage less options. Um, Solomon says, I would love a versus discussion about the X-T1 and better glass versus X-T2 and kit lens for an entry into the Fuji line. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I seriously consider the X-T1. I think that for a lot of people that are just looking to get into the system, uh, if you want uh, a battery grip because you need the extra power, uh, but you don't necessarily need massive resolution because you're not going to be printing out, 16 megapixels is going to be just fine. Like we were talking about earlier, people were, you know, they were printing on uh, 20 by 30 prints uh, with 12 megapixels. So if you're just looking for entry because they have amazing glass yeah, I think the XC1 is still a fantastic option. Yeah, and keep in mind, somehow, Fujifilm is still releasing firmware updates for the XT1, just the one last week. It's, it's uh, unbelievable. Yeah, that last uh, that last update, uh, what was it, uh, 2.10? Uh, yeah. They released new stuff for the XT1, so yeah. you're, you're not abandoned, at least from everything that I've seen thus far, right. no matter how old your camera is. Yeah, but that guy gave me a good idea for a video. I think I'm going to do a video on that next. The, you really should. The, yeah, really good glass on the X-T1 versus X-T2 to see if, you know, what the, the quality looks like. I'm going to do that. So do you, do you still own the X-T1? I do. Yeah, I have the X-T1 and the X-T2, and then I have six Fujinon lenses. You should do it. Yeah. You should definitely uh, do it. I'll, I'll be watching. I'll thumbs up your shit. Yeah, I'm going to do it. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's see. And Lucas says, I'd recommend better glass, upgrade body later. Always, always invest in glass first. Yeah, if you only 100%. got money for one thing, you always buy glass. Body, you know, especially with the Fuji stuff, because of the fact that they are upgrading camera, uh, a camera now that is, what, almost four years old. Um, ben also says, a good point, but the no blackout viewfinder is a really nice touch. I, I will agree, but I will say that the electronic viewfinder, I was using it yesterday, the blackout time, was almost non-existent. I mean, it was not, I, I heard a little electronic click in the background when the electronic shutter went off and that was pretty much it. Like I didn't feel like I was missing anything. Yeah, I would agree on that. I've, I mean, it's there, but I don't really notice it that much, but again, I'm not a sports shooter. So, you know, right. But, but still, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I can live with it. It's, it's not noticeable at all for me. Uh, Dynamite soul says, should I buy the, uh, 56 millimeter 1.2 or the 23 millimeter F2, uh, plus the 35 millimeter F2 for around the same price. Oh man, that is rough because I don't know. The 56 one, two is probably the King portrait lens in the Fuji lineup. Um, with the 23, you're getting a 35 millimeter equivalent, which would be excellent for street. Um, the 35 is the 50 mil, mil, uh, millimeter equivalent. Uh, if you're doing portraits, always go with whatever's going to give you better bokeh, in my personal opinion. So if I was buying, or if I had to make that choice, it would probably be the 56 one, two. Yeah. Yeah. The 56 1.2, or I've heard, and I don't own this. I've heard really good things about the, uh, the 90 F2 is like razor sharp, but that's more along the lines of telephoto, especially with the 1.5 crop. But yeah, the, I own the 56 1.2 and I can say that it, the Boca at 1.2 is ridiculous. Yeah. And 
um, I've actually looked at the 90 millimeter because I know that uh, some studio portrait photographers actually like to get a bit further back to give their model a little bit more breathing room, not have that uber intimate uh, contact, you know, yeah. just kind of let them, you know, do their poses and, and work their shit. And the 90 millimeter translates into what? I think like a 135 on a full frame. Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, and yeah, and I've heard absolutely nothing but great things about the 90 millimeter. So if you're doing studio work and you want to give yourself a little extra room, um, yeah, a little extra compression, I guess, with the longer lens, I, I think you probably do really well with the 90 millimeter. Yeah, definitely. Um, and Chris Barr says, as you know, I love Sony, but the A9 needs work. Uh, it's a waste if you ask me. And overheating just while shooting photo is a joke. My A6500 on high plus in the sun has never shut down. It's good info to have because I know that a lot of people are kind of pissed right now. <laughs> um, Andrea says, uh, or I'm sorry, Hater says, how about the Tamron 35 uh, F1.8 for my new uh, D750 for street and general use? I, uh, Tamron's making pr some pretty good stuff here lately. Do you own any Tamron lenses? Uh, yeah, I, I own the 15 to 30, the wide angle with the huge bulbous front element. Right. And I will say one thing. So I, I used to own the 14 to 24 Nikon, which is like the... You know, it's supposed to be like the best wide angle lens. Um, the the Tamron 15 to 30 smokes the, the Nikon 14 to 24. And I was so surprised. The image quality is better. The distortion is less. And the Nikon 14 to 24 has almost no distortion. But it's it's just, it's unbelievable. It's the only Tamron lens I've ever owned. And I'm so pleased with it. Now, it weighs 150 pounds. But <laughs> it's, so, it's so good. So that's the only one I've used. I can't speak to the 35. But I'll tell you that... Uh, if it was Tamron versus Sigma, I would probably go with Tamron at this point, just based on where the market is and the quality the, from from my past experiences. Yeah, and if you're shooting on a Sony camera, uh, the Sigma 18 to 35 f1.8 and the 50 to 100. If you're just looking for an all-around complete system, you know you're going to want to look in that direction. I know that the Tamron, um, I think it's their uh, 24 minutes. I think it might be the, did you say it was an 18 to 35? Is that what it is for the Tamron or is it a 16 to 35? Did I cut out or something? Uh, yeah, I was uh, talking to you, Eric. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, oh no, the, it was a 15 to 15, 15. Okay. 15 to 30, I think is what it was. Um, I, I think that they make another wide angle. I can't remember exactly what the focal length is. Uh, I know that my friend Joe Jackson on Joe's photo, uh, channel, um, grabbed a new Tamron for his Canon. And that seems to be like razor, razor sharp. I don't know, uh, you know, the longevity of, of Tamron lenses. I don't know how good their support is. Um, but from everything that I've seen, a lot of people are really enjoying what Tamron's been putting out there. So, yeah, I was, I was impressed because the, the price difference is pretty huge there too. Uh, Lynn says, since I got the X-T2, I never use my Canon 5D Mark III anymore. Love the Fuji 50-140 f2.8. And you know what? I, I hear that all the time. Um, I can't go, I, I literally cannot go anywhere on the interwebs and hear anyone saying anything really bad about any of Fuji's lenses except the 18 millimeter. Other than that, I mean, it is just and, and, and I don't want to sound like a Fuji fanboy at all. I always try my best to stay as objective as possible because, um, you know, I try out too much stuff and I don't want to go, oh, well, this is only, you know, the best thing since sliced bread. But it is so hard to go anywhere and find anyone that takes a shit on anything that Fuji has been putting out. Uh, let's see. What else do we got? I mean, do you have, have you read anything bad about anything Fuji since you've been in the system? Um. I mean, other than a couple of the little like software features in the menu and custom function button stuff that they've already fixed, right? Um, no, other than I have heard that the 35 1.4 and the 23 1.4 um, are not quite as good as the new F2 versions of those as far as image quality and distortion. Uh, but but again, when we're talking about a Fuji lens that Fuji shooters consider as like not so good. It's not a bad lens. It's just not as good as other Fuji lenses. So yeah, I haven't really heard anyone just like completely tear apart a Fuji lens. Yeah, and the only other thing that I've heard that a couple of people have kind of bagged on it was the fact that I think it was the 35 <clears throat> 1.4 that it was a little. It had a lot of um, uh, shutter chatter. It was a little loud when it was yeah. focusing. But yeah. I mean, other than that, I mean, if the if the end result is the image, and it's always the end result is the image. Yes. Um, then I, I don't know that I would really give that many Fs about how much little chatter that it made while it was trying to focus. Yeah. 
Uh, and if I guess if I gave it crap that much, I would just manually focus. So, uh, David also says, I sold my old A6000. I've been looking uh, at the original Sony A7, uh, but I'm also attracted to the Olympus Micro Four Thirds. Which way, uh, which way to choose? Maybe Fuji. Uh, that's a rough one. Uh, the A6000 still produces fantastic images. I, I used it to take, which is a, a little crazy, but I, I used the A6000 to take some images of some of the photo, uh, Sony lenses that I was selling on eBay. So I don't know. That that sounds odd. It's like cannibalizing my own self. Um, but yeah. yeah, it still takes fantastic images. Yeah, um, one thing I'll say about the whole sensor size thing too uh, is that if you're, if you're into landscape photography like I am, um, I've noticed that I get, uh, or I guess I don't have such a hard time getting all of the photo in focus with the Fuji system because it's an APS-C uh, sensor. And so while I'm not getting as much uh, depth of field as far as, you know, bokeh with portraits, I'm getting, uh, you know, more of that in landscape. Is, is I don't have to worry about hyperfocal distance and focusing a third into the way because it's the depth of field isn't quite so shallow, right? So I'm actually able to get more of the scene easier in focus instead of you know full frame medium format you have to be pretty careful where you focus or some of the foreground will be uh, pretty you know soft and so with APS-C micro four thirds you don't have to worry about that as much if you're if you're a landscape shooter and you also have to keep in mind the situation so you know a lot of people go APS-C when they're shooting wildlife or landscapes because they do get that extra reach <clears throat> so yep. you know there's just all there's always something to consider and there's always a potential compromise depending on what you shoot how you like to get it done and you know you have to literally find the right system that works for you or it's always going to be oh well shit i you know i could do this you know you just sometimes you're going to be put in a situation especially for professional um that you're your photography or your videography requires that you have exactly what your clients want. You might end up buying two systems. Hell, you might end up buying three systems to get your job done. Um, and while it may suck, you're getting paid to get it done. So, you know, you're not going to find the perfect thing all in one package, but you might, you just might find the right perfect package that's right for you. So, right. And don't ever be afraid to rent gear either. You know, I've had to rent stuff that I don't own for certain jobs and, and a lot of people will, you know, just like to own it. But I mean, if you have to, to rent something like a, you know, medium format for a certain gig, someone wants a, you know, a 200 inch wide print, that's going to be like a six foot viewing distance. You might have to go get a, you know, a Hasselblad or a Fuji GFX or something. Um, do you have any experience with the, um, the the two x teleconverter on Fuji. Do you own any of the teleconverters? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I haven't heard anything bad about it. Like that with the one hundred to four hundred. A friend of mine actually took that on an African safari and loved it. But I have not had any personal experience with it. Yeah, I don't have any experience with the teleconverter yet either. I, of course, I don't think that I'm really going to need that level of reach. But should the need ever arise, it's nice to know that it's already available. Now, granted, if you use the teleconverter, uh, you are going to lose about a stop of light. Uh, so if you're using, say, like the 50 to 1.4, if you put the uh, 1.4x on there, you're going to basically be using it at at, at, at an f4. So uh, just keep those things in mind. So if you're out in good daylight, you should be fine, though. Uh, you're just going to lose a little bit of depth of field or gain a little extra depth of field so your bokeh won't be as, as, uh, as good. Um, Mark, when are you buying the GFX? I'm not. I don't need medium format. Um, Let's see. Also, dun 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 dun. Uh, per S says the 1.4 is loud, but at the same time, love. So <laughs> there you go, man. I mean, you know, people are willing to overlook it if the end result is beautiful image quality. So right. um, do you have any final thoughts? Do you have anything that you want to add to? Uh, do you have any, you know, thing um, that you uh, want to leave the viewers with? Yeah, I'll just say that, you know, at, at the end of the, the whole Fujifilm talk because most of the video has been about Fujifilm and while we love it, you know, it's, it's really get the gear that works for you. You know, like, like Mark said, rent it. If you have to, don't just take the advice of, you know, us YouTubers, bloggers, whatever, get it in your hands, use it. And then as far as my final thoughts on the Fujifilm X-T2 specifically, uh, most of the, the improvements that I said it needed in my full review, they have fixed almost all of it in firmware updates. So if that tells you anything about the company, it's pretty impressive. Um, 
I also wanted to say that I've really enjoyed the talk in general, and I would like to do it on a more regular basis. So if you guys are interested in either maybe seeing me on his channel or him back on this channel, don't forget to thumbs up this video. Leave us some nice comments. Uh, don't forget to go show Eric some love over on his channel. Um, I can't remember the name of the channel because it's not Finding Middle Earth, although you can just look up Eric Marks or Finding Middle Earth and a shit ton of his videos are going to pop up. You're, you're, <laughs> you're going to find it really easy. I think it's like Lawton something. Yeah, yeah. So funny backstory on that very quickly. It's, it, I think it's, well, it, you can get there by going youtube.com slash Finding Middle Earth. But when I created it, it was youtube.com slash Lawton Records. Uh, I used to own a recording studio. So it oh, started yeah. out as a recording studio channel and then like years into making no videos, I just turned into photography. <laughs> cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well then it's really, it's going to be really easy because all you do is Eric Marks or finding uh, middle earth. You'll find his channel. Uh, if you're looking at the Fuji system, he's been in it longer than I am. So uh, his information is going to be much more uh, replete with uh, more experience than me. Uh, hopefully I'll get there someday, but he'll always be ahead of me. So definitely go check out his channel. <laughs> and uh, uh, subscribe for sure. Uh, and if I uh, can tack on one more thing, I also wanted to let everyone know that uh, if you did the film project that we had going on for this month, be sure to get those film images into me uh, sometime tonight or sometime early tomorrow because I'm going to be producing that video uh, sometime tomorrow and releasing it. So get those into me as soon as possible. All right, man. So I appreciate you coming on the channel. Too, it's been a blast. Cool, cool. And if you're interested in doing it again, you just let me know, brother. Definitely. All right, man. All right, guys. So I appreciate everyone coming and hanging out with me here on the Photo Video Show. Don't forget to go check out Eric Marks' channel at Finding Middle Earth. And I will see you guys again on the next one. Peace.